Well, we only have a few more days until the NBA Finals get underway, but what a matchup we have. The Boston Celtics, best team in the regular season throughout the playoffs against uh, one of the best teams in the NBA since the uh, post-trade deadline acquisitions of P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford and the Dallas Mavericks go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the NBA Finals. For a preview, we head to Boston uh, for the Boston Sports Journal and Locked On Celtics podcast. John Corrales, kind enough to join us. Thanks for taking a few minutes for us, man. How you doing? It's, I'm doing great. It's my pleasure. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Look, what are you guys doing to fill this time? Because it was quick work in the Eastern Conference Finals. It was a long wait for Boston uh, to get ready for Thursday's Game 1. How are you guys filling this time in between the Conference Finals and the NBA Finals? Playing some Uno, catching up on some yard work, you know, crossword puzzles. We're filling the time. We're making it work. John, all jokes aside... What are the storylines this year that are different than it, that have been there for the Jays between Tatum and Brown? Because it's it's become a little bit like um, I don't want to make the direct comparison. But this 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 run for the Celtics feels very reminiscent of a run that was here in Portland, where Portland was looked at as one of the best teams in basketball in the late '80s, early '90s, and yet they came up short. They lost to dynasties. They they you know fell short in in other circumstances where they had no business falling short you know Miami last year what what is kind of the storyline and the the tenure of the Jays is is this kind of the defining moment if they don't win here I, I don't I don't think so I understand why people are saying that but I, I think people need to understand the genesis of this this core and unlike that Portland team that you're talking about, this core has gone through, this is like the third iteration. Because people got to remember, it started with Kyrie and Gordon Hayward. You got to go all the way back to Gordon Hayward signing with Boston when Tatum was a rookie and Jalen was in the second year. And people are kind of counting that as part of the big argument against them when they were you know, 19 and 20 years old. And then Kyrie's here for a couple of seasons and he goes away. And that was bad. And then you go from that. To, did you feel it in my voice when I said yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you go from that to the Kemba Walker era, which, you know, Kemba was great, but, you know, he, he gets hurt. His knee is, is an issue. And Gordon Hayward never gets back to where he was going to be. And then, you know, Al Horford had left. So the, the, now, now you're on your third kind of iteration where, Kemba goes back out, Horford comes back in, Gordon Hayward goes away, and this is strictly centered around the Jays. Now, they did have that disappointment last year, for sure. But I don't think it's entirely fair to count all those prior years mm -hmm. as equal to the past year or two. So that's a kind of a long way to go to, I think this team is different. I don't think they are as Jalen and Jason centric as it may seem. They're obviously the engine that drives this thing, but the beauty of this team is Derek White, Drew Holiday, Christoph Porzingis, Al Horford can all make big contributions. And if one of those other guys needs to step back, maybe pass more, facilitate more, they're willing to do that, and they're they're willing to do that this year much more than they ever have in the past. You know, and that's something. I'm glad that you say that because that's something that at the Eastern Conference Finals, when Jalen Brown gets the MVP award, you, we have people like freeze framing everybody's facial expressions, especially especially Jason Tatum's, and is like, "Oh, is he actually happy for yeah. Jalen Brown or not?" That would that bothered me because I was sitting there and everything that those guys have gone through it does seem like they all have bought into that team first mentality. They have. Look, let's, let's get to the heart of this. The Celtics are boring and <laughs> these, pl these places have time to fill. Mm -hmm. They can't not do shows. These talk shows, these debate shows still have to do an hour or two or whatever they have to do every day, all, you know, five days a week. And the Celtics give you nothing when it comes to storylines. They, they, have handled their business against the teams that are bad and they've won. They, they've only lost twice in the first three rounds. One of them was uh, an outrageous outlying shooter performance for the Miami heat. One of them was just a ridiculous Celtics couldn't hit a thing performance against the Cleveland Cavaliers. 
So when you win in five, five, and four on your way to the, the finals, what is there to talk about? And But people don't want to believe that they're dominant. So they come up with, well, maybe maybe things were too easy for them, or let's let's psychoanalyze everybody. Let's Zapruder film the Eastern Conference Finals MVP presentation and be like, oh, Jason Tatum's smile was two inches above baseline, <laughs> and it should have been three point two. That's what science. You know, so, like, I get it. I get it. It's noise, and whatever. People got to talk, and people got to fill their time. The Celtics are bought in. They're they're 100 percent behind what Joe Mazzulla said has been saying. This is without a doubt a special season, and frankly, I think the Celtics kind of have to win this year because this is such a special season mm. that you don't get locker rooms like this, you don't get cohesion like this very often. Even if they bring everybody back next season, something's going to be different. So this is their opportunity. Everyone is bought in. Everyone is is behind the goal. The coach has the room. So this is their opportunity to do it. Beyond the psychoanalyzation, I, I've watched the Celtics team. I've seen them, you know, in, in person here. Uh, and my God, did they look incredible. My my one criticism of them has been that they are incredibly great at the thing that they do which is uh-huh. a, is a drive and kick machine when they are t- taken out of that which the Pacers were able to do to an extent at times they looked to falter and i wonder if you're obviously you're knee deep in Celtics and have been forever do you think this is a team that can adapt stylistically or or are they just such an overwhelming machine that it doesn't matter i think it's a little bit of both um they are an overwhelming machine. So they will drive and kick. And I think that's going to be the majority of the series mm-hmm. because there are weak defenders on the perimeter. They love, love, love Dallas loves, love, loves to protect the rim. And so they're going to draw help. They're, they're habitually going to help. And that's going to lead kicks and swings and second attacks. And so I think someone's just going to do that a lot, but, I do agree that they are and have been very willing to fall into ISO mode. Mm -hmm. And that's one of their, one of their weaknesses, less so this season, but definitely in seasons past that you can draw Tatum and Brown into attacking a matchup and kind of like dangle it like bait, like a Venus (laughs) flytrap, draw them in, trap them, and then they turn the ball over or take bad shots or, or whatever, make bad decisions. They've been better at that. And I'm going to use that closeout game against the Pacers as an example of Jalen Brown in a, a clutch moment, right? You need, you need a shot. You, you have the opportunity to be the hero. And he kicks to the corner and Derek White hits the shot. Mm-hmm. That is a huge moment to me, not just because of the magnitude of the shot, but Jalen would undoubtedly force that shot every year prior to that moment and, and might even turn the ball over before he got to the shot in some years. So I think they're more willing to do the things that are necessary. And again, Missoula has hammered the rim reads and making the right play into their heads. And it's been working so far. So they have faith that it's going to work again, I think. John Corrales is our guest, Locked On Celtics uh, podcast host, Boston sports journal as well. Um, how can you put into perspective what Portland Trailblazers legend and great Drew Holiday has meant to this team? <laughs> Played a lot well, of I good mean, basketball here. Yeah, Portland. yeah. I mean, that the memories must be so <laughs> great. I don't want to disrespect those at all. Um, <laughs> Holiday has been huge. And I think came along at the right time. And I was always a big Marcus Smart guy. And I still am. He's, he's, I think, capable of willing teams emotionally, finding places emotionally to, to, to draw something out of teams that, that, that is kind of special. But this team, I think, might have grown out of that. And they needed a little less of the Marcus Smart chaos and maybe a little more of the Drew Holiday, 
willingness to sacrifice uh, and just his ability to do some of these other things and frankly hit the shots, right? You know, like Marcus for all of his, all of the things that I loved about him playing just some nights, (laughs) more nights than the most he didn't quite have it. And you'd see teams like he was the guy that you would leave. And, you know, going into this finals, I think the biggest questions for me are who do Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving guard. And undoubtedly one of those guys is going to end up on Drew Holiday. And that's going to be a problem for Dallas, I think, because Holiday and Derek White are going to be uh, outlets for Tatum and Brown when they drive, or they're going to be the drivers themselves. And they're going to be the driving kick guys. And they're going to have to hit the floaters or get into the, into the, uh, you know, restricted area and stuff. So, I think what Holiday is able to do and what he's able to do on both ends of the floor uh, has been special for the Celtics. Uh, Joe Mazzulla has trusted him a lot with the defense, you know, putting him in weird positions that kind of helped him grow as a defender. So, yeah, I think Holiday has has been great. Uh, I know he has fond memories of what Chauncey Billups allowed him to do on the floor as well, but I think Joe Mazzulla has just done it a little bit differently. I, and I, I think to your point about Marcus Smart, like instead of a guy who's trying to prove that he can make the shots, the Celtics just needed a guy who's done it before and can just go out and make those shots, right? Right, right. And and be willing to not take the shots, I think is maybe the more important thing. <laughs> you know, like when the situation didn't call for that shot, he he is willing to move it. Um, yeah. John, if if you if you had to put your 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 feet in enemy ground here, how do the Mavericks win this series? Well, it's going to take something special from Luca. Obviously, um, I think it's going to be a combination of what we've been seeing: Luca and Kyrie having having special games. Um, I, I, it's going to be tough. Like, uh, I think the Celtics' defense is able to attack them. I know Minnesota's defense was great, but I, I just think that the Celtics defenders are so much more versatile than like Minnesota did what they did well, but they, they weren't as versatile as Boston's going to be. So I, I, I do question Dallas's ability to put up the amount of points they're going to need because Boston's going to have to put up a lot of points. So step one, Luca is going to have to be Luca. Step two, if Boston's going to have to miss a, a bunch of threes, like you're, I think Boston's going to put up 45, 53 pointers a game in this series. And and you're just going to have to, some of it is forcing them off the line or forcing them into tougher shots. And some of it's just going to have to like cross your fingers and hope the shooting variance goes your way for a series. Kind of like the shooting variance went Miami's way in last year's Eastern conference finals where Boston went an entire series without being able to hit shots. (laughs) That that's going to have to be part of the, the, calculus for for the Mavs and they're going to need their bigs to to do a lot of hard work in that regard because it's not just defending the rim it's getting over to deter at the rim getting out to the corners and recovering back for a second attack that's going to that's going to put a lot of pressure on on the Mavs bigs and I think an underrated key that people haven't really been talking much about is Derek Lively as a rookie, as important as he is to what the Mavs have done, can you count on a rookie Mm -hmm. to make all of those plays? And when he makes a mistake, which everybody will inevitably make, how is he going to recover from that? How is he going to handle that? If he plays like a veteran, then the Mavs have a real shot. If he plays like a rookie and falters, then that's going to be a problem because Gafford is not going to have, I don't think as much success. And if lively doesn't have a whole lot of success, they're so key to what the Mavs do. They need those guys to find a way to contribute. What amount of Kristaps Porzingis do you think we're going to be seeing in, in the first game or two of this series and in, in his importance to what Boston is going to have on the floor? I, I think he's going to play. I think he's going to, um, get probably 20 to 25 minutes. I think it's going to be uh, a, a slower ramp up, but I think he's 
Uh, I mean, how slow can it be? It's, there's only seven games left at most, but uh, he's going to have to be ready to play somehow. But I, I don't think they need him to be, you know, much more than 25 minutes a game. It's going to be uh, uh, starting, I think, in five-minute bursts and come out, rest. How do you feel? Catch your breath. Go back in. Uh, and the, so, obviously, he's a big rim, rim protector for for Boston, um, and and that's going to help because, obviously, the Dallas Mavericks loves to drive against the rim. If you have him there as a deterrent, that's going to help. Uh, he's such an outlet for Tatum and Brown where he's their number one assist targets. Both of those guys hit him more than anybody else, so he's going to be a big outlet for them. And also, importantly, he moves Al Horford to the bench, so you could play 20 to 25 minutes of Porzingis and then – 20 to 25 minutes of Al Horford, and you're not bringing in Luke Cornett, who I love, but you're not bringing in Luke Cornett to be part of the NBA Finals. He's there for maybe spot minutes, emergency minutes, but not counting on him minutes. And that's, I think, a big deal. All right, John, before we let you go, uh, how does this series play out? What's your series prediction? I think it's going to be Celtics and six. Um, I think, I think I'm, Luca is going to have a couple of a couple of games where he just is too good, uh, and that's fine. But I just think the Celtics are just so well rounded and so um, so good on both ends of the floor that they don't have obvious places to attack, and the Mavs do, and that is a problem. Even though they have the best player in the series. They have weaknesses that Boston can attack and will attack. And I don't know who does Luca guard? Who does yeah. Kyrie guard? That that's if you have to ask that question, that's that's a problem to me where you say, Okay, who does Jason Tatum guard? Pick one. Who cares? You know, they can all guard. <laughs> so that that I think is the difference in the series. All right, John. Thank you for the time, man. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. There he is, John Corrales, Boston Sports Journal and Locked on Celtics podcast. Uh, they do. They got two of the best players in the series, mm-hmm. I think, combined when you look at w- with Luka being number one. And I don't think it's particularly close. No, who's, and who's look, after John him. is Boston as it gets, and he said it without question. Luca's the best player in the series. Not even close. It's not. It's that's not a debate, guys. Like that's for all. Well, Jay, no, Tatum's not. Mm-hmm. Not it. It is a. Very clear gap, and that's fine. The team, the team, the team, yep. though. You know, and that's going to be the most insufferable Boston thing ever because they're going to be like, it's like the Patriots and the Red Sox yeah. and the Bruins. It's like, spare me. And it's, it's they're like, really good. It's like the town. And I love it. Oh, Joe Mazzula's favorite team or movie, <laughs> favorite movie. That's no, the same thing. Is the town. All right. Um, Zombie town Celtics. <laughs> Great stuff from John Corrales. 